Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Philippi from the King James text, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Philippians chapter 3 verses 13 and 14. Would you bow your heads with me a moment as we go to the Lord in prayer. Master, once again, God, we humble ourselves in your presence. And Lord, we come before you desiring something at this moment very specific. When the word of God is broken open and the time has come for the preacher to deliver a word from heaven, there is no more sober hour in the church. There is no important moment in a worship service than this. Lord, the man of God, anyone who would fill the sacred desk needs the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I need you to work with me. People will not be convinced in their hearts that what they hear is from the Lord except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. People will not be challenged. Lord, they will not feel the need to change, to work on improving themselves, myself, except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We need conviction today. We need today, Lord, for you to allow our heart to know that what is being delivered is indeed a message from God to his people. Anoint today, O oh God, the speaker, anoint every hearer. Those that are listening live at this very moment, those who will listen live at a later time, Lord, anoint the ear of every hearer that they might receive today, O oh God, that which the Spirit would speak unto the church. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Glory to God. Amen. Want to talk to us for a while today on the topic the proper use of rear view mirrors. Too many believers live their lives today in a manner that would be fatal if it were embraced in their driving habits as it relates to automobiles. Anyone who has driven for any length of time knows that rearview mirrors are essential to safe driving. But they can also be dangerous if one becomes obsessed with looking into them. We need to see and we need to know what is going on behind us and beside us. But the vast majority of our time ought to be spent looking forward, eyes on the road. When we're needing to break, when we need to come to a stop, especially a swift or sudden stop, it's wise to quickly glance in the rearview mirror to see if another vehicle is dangerously close. When we need to change lanes, it's imperative that we be able to see if another vehicle already occupies the lane which we desire to move into. When our vehicle begins to act up or break down, 
If something's wrong, something's not functioning properly. Maybe a tire's blown. We need to quickly see what is happening around us so we don't allow our vehicle to move into an unsafe or already occupied area of the road. But driving down the road while constantly looking in our rear view mirrors is even more dangerous than not paying them any attention at all. The biggest problems that many folks face today is remembering the past and in so doing placing blame rather than developing the necessary skills that they require to move on. But just because you may have a tendency to have, for instance, an explosive reaction to criticism, and I use this as an example because this is something that I have and do struggle with in my own life. Because of an abusive, critical, or nasty parent or an adult uh, influence in our early life, there is no reason that you cannot move on knowing that not every criticism is the same. As we grow older and experience life, we should be able to see things more clearly. I can address issues in my life today as an adult, not as a hurt eight-year-old boy. I don't live there anymore. I see things differently than I did then. The pain and the hurt caused in my life when I was that age may never entirely leave me. There are dents in my car that are still there. I wish I could get them out, but for whatever reason, especially the small dents, for whatever reason, they just don't seem to want to go anywhere. These dents are pretty much a permanent fixture, I'm afraid. But I have grown. I've driven many miles since then. You know, Tommy, sometimes we come out to our car and somebody carelessly, thoughtlessly has opened their door, especially when we've got a new car. I swear there's somebody out there who just loves to be the yep. first one to ding your new car, you know. Yep. You got a brand new car, you're so proud of it, it looks so nice, the paint is beautiful, it's flawless, the body is without dent or deep, and somebody comes out at Kroger and decides they're just going to open their door up and let it slap right up against your car, and when you come out from picking up your bread, your eggs, your milk, you walk to your car and there you see it. It's not the biggest thing in the world. It's only about, oh, maybe half an inch tall. It's not the biggest. But my God, it might as well have crashed in your whole front end because you see it. Every time you leave your vehicle and every time you come back to it, you see it every single time. My grandfather, <laughs> he cracked me up years ago. He could give some very sage advice. He could give some good advice. One thing he told me many years ago, he said, never work on your own house. I said, well, Grandpa, what do you mean by that? He said, do all the carpentry and all the fixing up for other people that you want to do. He said, but never do it for yourself. Hire somebody to come and work on your own house. And I said, well, why in the world would I do that? I could save money if I just do the work myself. My father used to do all kinds of work himself on our house, you know. And I, and, and I like to work on my own property and stuff, you know. And Grandpa said, I'll tell you why. He said, because every mistake you make, 
it is going to be staring you in the face every day that you live there. It took me a little bit of living life. It took me a little while <laughs> growing up and experiencing some things to understand what my grandfather meant. I got news for you. He was right. You do your own work on your own house and all you have to do is cut that mold in just a little short. Or leave that carpet just a little bit cut wrong in that corner over there. Or whatever you may be doing, you know. And by God, every time you sit in that room, guess what you're going to be looking at? Guess what you're going to be thinking about? Every time you think about that bloody molding, and you're just sure as shooting, you're just sure as you're alive that everybody who comes into your house is they walk in and immediately boing, their eyes focus on your mistakes, their eyes focus on where you goofed up. Well, I'm going to tell you the same thing is true of your automobile. When you've got a little ding or a little dent in your car, man, I'm going to tell you, every time you come out to your car, you're going to see that ding. Every time you come out to your car, you're going to see that dent. It frustrates you. It aggravates you. You know, it's so expensive sometimes to fix even the slightest thing. And some of those little tiny dings, I'm going to tell you something, for the body shop to fix it, they got to take the panel off the door, they got to take everything off, and they got to bang that out, and then they got to do this, and they got to do that, and you know, and it costs hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and your insurance ain't going to cover it. Just to knock out the careless ding that was put in your vehicle by some stranger who didn't care nearly as much about your property as you do. Am I telling the truth? Well, I'm going to tell you, as human beings, we go through a lot of things in life. We get dinged up. We get dented up. We get banged up. We get injured. We get hurt. Some of those hurts and some of those injuries, thank God, don't really leave any physical damage. I've had people bump into the back of my car and it sounded worse than it looked because when you go and you look, there's only the slightest scratch or maybe there's not a scratch at all, but boy, it sure sounded bad when, when it happened. But we get dinged up we get banged up and the last thing in the world we need to do is think about the cause of that dent every stinking time we look at it yes some idiot at Kroger banged their door into my car some careless person let their carriage, you know, run into my car. Um, okay, we understand what caused it. We understand, you know, what uh, happened. But you know what? It's not worth remembering. It's not worth thinking about. Some people think just because they got a dent or just because they got a ding that every time they see it, they ought to revisit the accident. Hello now. But honey, there are proper uses for rear view mirrors. There are times when you need to look back and there are times when you don't need to bother with it. Hello now. And I'm going to tell you, the majority of your time ought to be spent looking forward. Looking forward. Looking toward where you're going, not where you've been. Hallelujah. All the enemy will try to distract us. He will try to get us off our path. And he will do it most often by stirring up some memory from our past. I don't know about you. I wish to God that I grew up perfect. I wish to God that I could look back at my youth and say, 
everything I ever did was perfect. Every decision I ever made was perfect. I never hurt anybody. I never offended anybody. I never did anything that was hurtful to anybody. I wish I could say that, but if I'm going to be truthful, I can't. I can't. If I'm going to be truthful, I recognize looking back, and there are times that I, I know the enemy's just working on me. There are times I'll be here at the house and not much is going on, and for some reason it's like Satan just begins to flood my thoughts with things I did as a young person, things I did as a teenager, things I did as a kid that were foolish and stupid and maybe hurt somebody's feelings or maybe, you know, hurt somebody physically, whatever the case might be. And boy, that thought will just haunt me and haunt me until finally... I decide that I've got to get my eye off the rearview mirror and get back to looking at the road. Hello right, now. Right. i got to quit thinking about yesterday and start looking forward till tomorrow. Looking in the rearview mirror is not serving me any positive, good, or constructive purpose at this moment in time. So get your eyes off the mirror. Quit looking backwards. It's not helping you to move forward. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Now, if you're going to move backwards, then you better look backwards. If you're planning on going backward, then it wouldn't be a bad idea to look in your mirror and see what's behind you. See where you've been. Lady, before you go back to that abusive husband, before you go back to that situation, that relationship that was abusive and hurtful, before you go back to that mess, maybe you ought to look in your rearview mirror. Do you really want to go back there? Now there's the proper use of a rearview mirror. Do you really want to go back now there are times you got to go back. Sometimes you can't move forward until you first back up. I parked behind our house in front of the garage over here. I parked my Lincoln back there. And I'm going to tell you, I can't go forward because the garage is in front of me. The only way I'm going to be able to go anywhere, i got to back up first and I tell the truth. I'm going to tell you, there are times when in order to move forward in our lives, we have to revisit where we've already been. Hello now. we got to move back at least a few feet. So I look in my mirror and I look back and see if all is clear. And you know, I drove school bus for a few years. And when you drive school bus, they teach you uh, defensive driving. They teach you how to drive carefully and defensively and you're constantly going through these little classes and I love it. I learned an awful lot driving school bus. I learned so many good things driving a school bus. One of the things they tell you is never trust your overhead rear view up on the windshield. If there's any mistake a lot of people make, they look at that one mirror in the center of their windshield and they look and then they start going backwards. Well, all of a sudden something's coming in from one side or the other and they nearly get clipped or they do get clipped. Well, the problem is a smart person, a person who's been trained to drive knows that one of the little tricks we're taught is look at all your mirrors. All of them. Left, center, right. Because each one of them has, listen to me now, a different perspective. Each one of those mirrors is looking in the same direction, but it's looking at it from a different angle. Too many people, every time you hear them talk about the past, every time you talk about something that is behind them, the only perspective you ever hear come out of their mouth is theirs. 
That's that center mirror. I know what's behind me because I'm looking in my center mirror. I'm looking in my rearview mirror, glory to God. And if there's anything behind me, I can see it through this mirror. Um, why don't you look back now that you've grown up a little? Now that time has passed, now that you're an adult and you're no longer a child, now that you should have grown up and matured, hello, now that you should have experienced some things in life, now that you've been a mother, now that you've been a dad, now that you've been married, now that you've owned your own home, now that you've had to pay your own bills, hello now. Boy, Booby, how many things have changed in our lives in terms of the way we see things and the way we understand things because we've grown up. We've experienced some things. We've paid our own bills. We've had rent to pay. We have a mortgage to pay. We've, we've dealt with leaky roofs and we've dealt with uh, broken chimneys and we've dealt with... Uh, uh, water heaters that have gone bad and all of a sudden we think back to when dad got so aggravated over that water pump that broke at the house and oh he was so mad and so upset and and complaining every time you turn around something else is breaking down and costing money and blah, 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 blah. of course when you're a kid you think that magically money is just pouring into mom and dad's hands you don't know where it's coming from you're not with them at the factory you're not with them at their job you don't know what they have to go through in order to earn that money am i telling the truth so you don't appreciate how frustrating it could be when that money is being pulled on at every turn by a plumber or by an electrician or by a carpenter or by a fix-it man or a handyman. But oh boy, grow up. Buy your own house. All of a sudden you begin to experience things that should allow you, listen to me children, that should allow you to look in more than one mirror and see things behind you from a different perspective. Now that doesn't mean that you necessarily will look in more than one mirror. There are a lot of people who are still going to look in that one mirror. Oh, they've lived life, Tommy. They've had bills to pay. They know how frustrating it is. But you know what? They still look back and find fault with what Dad said or find fault with the way Dad said it. Or you, Do you follow what I'm saying? Now, I had a very strained relationship with my father. My father was a miserable human being. But that doesn't mean that every single thing he ever said or every single thing he ever felt was without any validity. Got news for you. There aren't very many people in the world who every word comes off their lips is invalid and, and wrong. No. No. Usually it's mixed. Now there are some people, 90% of what comes out of them is garbage, and the other 10% may be valid. There are other people, 80% of what they say is valid, and 10% is invalid, right? I watched an interview of uh, Jay Baker the other day on YouTube. That's Tammy Faye and Jim Baker's son. And he was talking about his mom. And he was saying how, he said, my mother was just the most loving person you ever saw in your life. He said, she could just love anybody. He said, you know, my parents were constantly being attacked. They were constantly being ridiculed and made fun of and attacked by people. He said, my mother couldn't go to the store without somebody yelling something profane and nasty at her. Can you imagine? that? What a terrible thing. 
He said, and my mother would look at that person that just said something nasty to her, and she'd wave at him and say, the Lord loves you. I'm sure I'd have been waving and saying something, but I'm not sure it would have been the Lord loves you. I think Tammy Faye was a little more sanctified than this old boy is. I'm not sure I'd have found the words, the Lord loves you. But he said, you know, he said, I'd watch her, and I never saw anybody who could love the way my mother loved. He said, now, I'm not going to say she couldn't get mad. He said, she could get mad sometimes. He said, it wasn't very often, but she could get mad. He said, could she say hurtful things? Yes, yeah, she could. She could. He said, now, she never said it to me. He said, I can honestly say my mother never spoke hurtful words to me. But I heard her speak hurtful words. He said, but it wasn't very often. You see, there are some people that the majority of what comes out of them is good, and there's a small part. Then there's other people, the majority of what comes out of them is trash, and a little bit of it is valid. But you know what? It doesn't kill you to give, as my grandmother Bell used to say, to give the devil his due. You know, there is nothing wrong with acknowledging that maybe in that situation, maybe in that particular circumstance, mom or dad was in the right to say or to feel what they were feeling or to say what they were saying. Maybe in that particular situation, brother or sister or husband or wife or partner was right to say what they said or to feel what they were feeling. At the moment, I couldn't see it. But time has passed. I've grown up. I've matured. I've become something that I wasn't. When I was a child, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11, the Apostle Paul said, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I'm going to tell you as the preacher of the gospel and as the pastor, if there's anything that I frequently see that can be so frustrating and so aggravating, I see people whose bodies have gone down the road a few miles, but their brain is still living 300 miles back. Their body has grown. Their body has matured. They've gone through life. They've gone through experiences. And yet they still think as a child. They still reason like they're a child. My God, hasn't your life experience, hasn't some of the things you've been through and some of the things you've gone through, haven't these things helped you to look in your rearview mirror every once in a while and look to one side and look to the other and you, you try to see it from a slightly different perspective and all of a sudden it comes into view and you don't see it quite the same way you did when you all you could do was look in that mirror directly ahead of you in the center of the windshield. Sometimes I look in my side view mirrors and I say, well, you know, now that I'm not a kid, now that I'm not a child, I understand a whole lot better. And this is true of many, many situations. This can be true in your workplace. This can be true in your marriage. This can be true in your relationship. This can be true with your relationship with your parents. 
As you get older, you're able to look through different mirrors. You're able to look side to side. You're able to see things from different perspectives. You're not frozen on your singular perspective. Children are only able to see things from one perspective. They have to learn empathy. They have to learn empathy. Parents need to teach their children. Well, look at it from his perspective. Look at it the way, you know, the kid comes home and says, well, this kid hit me today at school. And mom says, well, why did he hit you? And you say, well, I don't know. I just told him that his shirt was ugly. And mom or dad says, well, honey, let me ask you a question. How would you have felt if somebody at school had come to you and said, hey, that shirt is ugly. That shirt makes you look like you're this, or that shirt makes you look like that. How would that have made you feel if somebody had said that to you? Well, maybe I wouldn't have liked it too well, yeah? Well, you see, empathy is learned. We need to learn how to empathize. We need to learn how to see from other people's perspectives. One of the problems with people who uh, have certain personality disorders is that they are devoid of empathy. Mm -hmm. It is impossible for them to see anything from anyone's perspective but their own. I want to tell you folks, if that's where you're at in life, then you need to pray through. You need God's help. Because you're going to go through life with a lot of hurt. You're going to go through life with a lot of things and a lot of dents in your car. That every single time you look at it, all you're going to do is keep revisiting the accident. Revisiting what caused it. And you're going to get angry every time you look at it. You're going to get upset every time you look at it. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of them little things, a lot of them little things that aren't all that big. Um, if you'd learn to look at things from another perspective, if you'd learn a little bit of empathy... You'd be surprised how much hurt and how much unnecessary aggravation and anger you could clear out of your life. You'd be amazed how much negativity that doesn't need to be there that's cluttering your mind and cluttering your past. You'd be surprised how much of that foolishness you can sweep up and sweep out. If you learn to empathize. But see, empathy is how you go about looking in those side view mirrors rather than simply your rear view mirror. Empathy is what allows you to look at things from different perspectives. My grandfather had a blazing, the best way I can describe it is he had a blazing uh, <laughs> temper. That's the word I want, temper. My grandfather, bless his heart, I'm telling you, he, he couldn't get upset about something like, oh, sugar. No, you never heard Grandpa say, oh, sugar. I won't tell you what he did say, but it wasn't oh, sugar. And it was usually followed by, and I mean, he'd go off on these tangents. And you say, well, what happened? Did somebody just back into him and total his car? No, they left the spoon by the coffee facing upward rather than turning it so that it was facing downward. Oh, Pastor, surely you're kidding me. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. He insisted that what he called the bowl of the spoon, you know, the concave area on the spoon. He insisted when you laid it down after you stirred your coffee or what have you, next, because he kept one by the coffee pot, he drank a lot of coffee, that was probably the cause of half of his anxiety and half of his jitters and, and his personality. Seriously, again, this is what I mean about empathy. As I've grown up, I look back and I look at the different mirrors and I say, 
you know what? If I drank that much coffee, I'd have been wired for sound. I'd have been out of my mind. If I worked 16 hours a day like he did, I'd have been out of my mind. If I was working third shift like he did and was trying to get some sleep and I had 10 kids running around making noise, I probably would have come out screaming and hollering at him too. Not because I'm a mean, nasty, so gun, but because it's awful hard to try to function when you can't get any sleep. And when you're in that frame of mind, you don't always express yourself real gently and nicely and kindly. What really cracks me up is when people who act the same way complain about people who act that way. I've got to be careful about that. Sometimes I'll be talking about something that my father used to do or my mother used to do or whatever, and then I'll say to Tommy, I'll say, well, but I do the same thing sometimes, so... I better just cool my heels a little bit. If you think you got out of your childhood unscathed, if you think you grew up and you were able to completely leave mom and dad behind you and you don't have none of their attributes, you don't have any aspects of their personality in you, oh honey, you are so diluted it isn't even funny. The problem is most people, when they look in the mirror, there's, there's a lot of people that aren't happy with what they see, so all of a sudden they, they start seeing what they want to see rather than seeing what's really there. I'm going to tell you, you've got to train yourself to look in a mirror directly, to get right up in that thing. I don't want to scare anybody. Get right up in that mirror and see yourself for who you really are. It's not easy to do that. I'm going to tell you it takes a lot of takes a lot of effort. A lot of people don't realize but when you go to counseling whether it be your pastor counseling you or whether it be a psychologist or a psychiatrist really what a counselor, a good counselor a professional counselor, somebody who knows what they're doing. What they really try to do is they try to help you simply see yourself as you really are. That's what they're trying to do. Because a lot of times the problems we got in our lives, the frustrations we have in our lives, the things that cause us the most grief got news for you honey it's not because everybody in the world is bad and everybody in the world is lousy and everybody in the world is miserable but it's because of something in us and you'd be shocked if you can fix that well I'm going to tell you a little secret that, that's good news you can sit here and look at the preacher and get mad at me all you want to well of course you're going to say it's my fault bless God um you ought to be excited it's in you. You ought to be happy that it falls on you. You know why? Because when I was a kid, my mother used to tell me all the time, you can't change the world, but you can change you. Hello now. You can't change the way those folks feel and the way those folks act and the way those folks do, but you can change you. So learning that something, Tommy, is in me something I can work on and fix it may be a challenge it may not be easy but thank God it's something I can do the problem is most people go to counseling most people go to a pastor to a psychologist to a psychiatrist whatever the case might be and the minute that that psychologist or that psychiatrist or that pastor starts holding up a mirror and trying to help you see things the way they really are. Oh boy, guess what? I don't want to see him anymore. Why? Is he bringing accusation against you? Is he accusing you of things that aren't so? Is he making up things? No, not at all. 
but he's trying or she's trying to make me see what I don't want to see. This is why when you need help, you should go get help. Because a lot of times, you'll never be able to look in those side mirrors on your own. You'll never be able to see things from any other perspective except when other people are able to contribute to the conversation. And sometimes when you go to a counselor, you go to a pastor, you go to a psychiatrist or a professional, they're helping you to see things from that left mirror. They're helping you to see things through that right mirror so that you're not focused entirely on your perspective, on the way you interpreted past things, the way you interpreted things that are behind you. But they're helping you. They're trying to help you apply lessons in life. But haven't you grown up since then? Aren't you older than you were then? Haven't you gone through some life experiences since then? Have you ever been in that position that that person was in when they said those words that hurt you? Have you ever been in that position? Well, yeah, I have actually. And what did you say? I've got an example in my head that I wouldn't dare speak right now of somebody who crabs and complains about the way a parent would approach them and how one particular experience really, really offended them because this parent said things a certain way. And yet, I had an experience with this very person and I'm telling you, literally, almost word for word, I got the same reaction out of them Almost word for word, Tommy. Oh, but we can look back in our rearview mirror and find fault with our mom or our dad, but we can't see for a second where when the exact same situation was in our lap, we reacted the same identical way. You follow what I'm telling you now, folks? You better be careful. There's a way to use rearview mirrors that is positive and constructive and helpful. And there are ways to use rearview mirrors that will destroy you. They will kill you. They will cause you nothing but ongoing pain and agony. I once quit a job as a teenager at a jack-in-the-box of all places. Because the manager at the restaurant I was working in found that I had missed one small area while mopping the foyer. He had asked me to go out and mop the foyer, you know, where all the customers come in and order and all that. And I'd gone out and mopped it. And I was so proud of myself. I was 16 years old. I was so proud of myself. I thought I did such a great job. And he came out and looked at it and he said, oh, it looks great. Did a great job. Oh, but you know what? You, you see that over there? You missed one little area right there. He might as well stab me through the head with a sword. Now you might say, Pastor, I wouldn't have had that reaction. I'd have just gone and mopped that one little area, and it wouldn't have bothered me at all that he pointed it out to me. But his pointing it out to me had a very different it got a very different response from me because it translated in my mind to his being so unhappy with my work that he was for sure going to fire me. Now a lot of y'all are sitting there and you're saying, well, good God. Why in the universe would anybody react like that? Why would anybody think just because the manager said you missed that one little area over there? Why would you think he was going to fire you just because of that? Well, see, you didn't have my life experience. You didn't grow up the way I grew up. I grew up with a father. Now, I'm only sharing this to help illustrate. I'm not sharing this because I get any special glee out of it 
or even that I want to, to be honest with you. But I grew up with a father who, you could work yourself to death. You, you could go so far out of your way to try to do the best job you could ever do. And I tried in so many areas, God knows I tried. I tried in school to bring home the best grades. And I bring home a really good report card, and my father's reaction would be, Yeah, well, he's still an idiot. My mother would come home from a parent teacher conference and say, Oh, the teacher was saying that CJ, Chuck Jr., that CJ is such a genius, you know, he's he's got a genius level intelligence. And my father would say, Yeah, some genius. And then he'd proceed to tear me up and tear me down. And he did this. He didn't just do this to me. He did it to everybody. This, this is how he was. He did it to his wife. He did it to his three sons. He did it whether he was in front of strangers, whether he was in front of friends, whether he was in front of family. Um, he just tore you down and made you feel like garbage. So unfortunately, I grew up kind of hardwired so that every time I heard the slightest critique or the slightest criticism in my mind it immediately became this humongous thing because I had never had a little critique in my life I had never had my father say yeah he did a great job but no those words were never spoken. It was always, oh yeah, well look, he missed this over here. And, and he'd act like my missing that one little thing just ruined everything. You know, that, that everything I did was worthless and useless and a failure and a flop. Because after all, I missed this one little stupid thing. You know, that's how I grew up. So when I was 16 and this boss told me, you know, uh, oh, and he started out. You did great, you know. And I felt so good. And they said, but you missed this. And the minute I would hear the slightest critique or the slightest criticism, it was just like somebody took a pin and popped my balloon. So no matter how good I felt at a compliment, immediately it just deflated and I went right back. I'm going to tell you a little secret. And I know this, I, I'm, I'm going to say this so Tommy didn't sit there and give me dirty looks back there. I still wrestle with this to this day, don't I? This is something, do I wrestle with it at the same level that I did when I was 16? No. Thank God, no. Thank God, no. I've grown up. I've gotten older. I've experienced some things in life. I've had experiences with people myself who they do a whole lot of things right, but then at the same time they do a couple of things really wrong. And I can't ignore what they do wrong for the sake of what they do right. Do you follow what I'm telling you? We've had people in our church who could cause more grief and more trouble in the church all because of a couple areas in their life where they had some trouble and did they do a lot of things right? Yes, they did. Did I tell them they did a lot of things right? Absolutely I did. If there's anything I learned from the way I grew up, I learned the value of being complimentary. I learned the value of being flattering. I learned the value of offering people praise and words, positive words. And I do that. But when it came time for me to have to say something about the area that was causing trouble, all of a sudden, boy, they were out of the church like a shot. They didn't want nothing to do with this old preacher. Am I telling the truth? Yep. Do I understand where they're coming from? I kind of do. I really do. I understand it. Does that make dealing with them any easier? No, it doesn't. Any more than I can explain to you all day and all night why I feel about things certain ways or why I do certain things certain ways. Understanding why people do certain things certain ways does not make dealing with that person any better. 
anything drives me crazy, it's dealing with somebody who thinks that because they can offer you an explanation for why they do this, that that's supposed to make everything grand and everything great. Have you ever dealt with somebody like that? Oh, I'm telling you, I got I got people in my family that that are like that. They they'll sit there and say, "Well, you know, I, I do I I experienced this because of what I've been through," and blah 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 blah. That's all well and good, but that doesn't change a thing when it comes to dealing with you. I've got a great aunt as an example who thinks she's the best singer that ever hit the planet. And in truth, she sounds like a cockatoo that's being choked. She's not at all a good singer. She, and I mean literally, she is not at all a good singer. But she thinks she's Kate Smith. She thinks she's Mariah Carey. She thinks she's Beyonce and Cher wrapped up in one. And she's told me the story growing up as a kid. You know, my father invited my sister to come out and sing in front of some friends of theirs who were visiting, and everybody thought that my sister could sing so beautifully. And oh, he wanted my sister, and my sister, she was too shy and too backward, and she didn't want to sing. And I told my dad, I'll sing for you. And he said, oh, no, thank you. You don't know how much that hurt me. <laughs> Grow up. Grow up. You're still crying over that and you're in your 80s? Come on now. Hello? You're still crying over that and you're in your 80s? You don't know how much that hurt me. I'm going to tell you something. That woman... If you didn't sing her praises over every cotton pick and thing she ever did, you were on her hate list. Literally. You know why I can't stand Donald Trump? You know why that man makes me want to vomit every time I look at him and every time he opens his mouth? Because I know what a narcissist looks like. I've got him in my family. And I'm going to tell you something. People who have to be praised who are full-grown adults because they've been to the potty and peed, I have a problem with. She's lived life. She's grown up. She couldn't look back and say, well, I guess, you know, he just wanted to showcase Eleanor's talents. You know, he just wanted to show off what Eleanor could do. And if she was going to act the fool over it, he just figured, oh well, leave it well enough alone. You know what I'm saying? No, we can't do that. We've got to keep looking in that rearview mirror and seeing only our perspective and revisiting the hurt and revisiting the pain like it's a good friend. Really? You really want to visit that pain and that hurt again like it's a good friend? I got news for you, honey. I was talking a moment ago about my father. I, I prefer not to talk about it at all if I have my way, and I try to avoid it as much as I can. But this boss made me believe, I was talking a moment ago, by simply pointing out an area that I had missed, he caused me to believe that he was surely going to fire me. I'm now an adult. I'm now old enough and mature enough to understand that my father was the exception, not the rule. He was and is to this day, to be frank, a mentally ill man with massive narcissistic personality issues. Knowing this, I do not have to assign the same level of excessive criticalness to everything said to me by others 
including friends, my partner, church members, so on and so forth. Now, Tommy, I've grown up. I realize my father, my, my father, everybody in the world doesn't act like my father. Just everybody that offers any kind of critique or criticism is not my father. Do you follow? Well, now I understand that. So now, when people offer a critique or they offer, you know, a, a criticism of some type, criticism can be a positive thing, folks. It can help you if you're willing to receive it. Now, when people offer a word of critique or a, or a constructive criticism, I'm able to accept it and receive it and work with it better than I used to. Now, again, am I saying that I still don't wrestle with some deep-seated? I'm not saying that. That dent will forever be in my car. But I've learned to look in my side mirrors, not just my rear view. When I look back, I'm able to see now through my side mirrors. I've lived life. I've had experiences. I've grown up. I'm not a child anymore. I don't have to think like a child. Why in the world would I look at something that happened to me when I was eight years old and still be looking at it through the eyes of an eight-year-old? trying to hurry today. Many cannot benefit from the Word of God or the preaching of God's Word because they are still stuck in their past. Until they can learn to move on, I'm not talking about moving forward. There's a lot of people move forward. Moving forward just means the years pass and you grow older and you get a few more wrinkles and you get, you know, get a few more pounds on your belly. You move forward, but you don't move on. Got news for you folks. Until you can learn to move on and not just move forward, you can never experience the fullness of God's best for you. The Word of God is full of counsel on how we can do better, be better, achieve more, realize more. If the enemy can convince us to live in the past and let destructive, negative figures from our past rent space in our minds, he knows that we will not ever be able to fully realize all that the Lord has for us. Did you hear me? The enemy knows that. So guess what he's going to do? He's going to do everything in his power to keep you living in yesterday. He's going to do everything in his power to make sure that the only mirror you ever look in is your rear view. He's going to do everything in his power. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. He's going to do everything in his power to make sure when you ought to be looking ahead, you're still looking back. And then you wind up in a total wreck. You wind up lonely. You wind up miserable. You wind up unhappy. You wind up broke. You wind up drug addicted. You wind up on alcohol. Why? Because you were so busy looking in the mirror you didn't pay attention to what was ahead of you. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 29 verses 11 and 13. I'm finishing up. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end or a positive constructive end then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and ye will seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart you know, the Apostle Paul was a smart man. He said, brethren, in our primary text, said, I, I don't count myself to have apprehended. He said, I, I'm not standing up here today claiming to be perfect. I'm not standing up here today claiming that I've, I've you know, got everything where it ought to be. And I'm, you know, and I'm here to tell you, as the preacher of the gospel today, I'm not up here claiming to be perfect. I'm not up here claiming I've got everything, uh, you know, all my ducks in a perfect row. But Paul said, but this one thing I do, 
forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Word of God teaches us looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The proper use of rearview mirrors. They can serve you and they can help you. Or they can destroy you. It's your choice. It's your choice. But if you're going to be helped by your mirrors, one thing you got to learn first, you need to look at more than simply the rear view. you got to look at the side view as well. You need all the mirrors that are available to you, not just the one. Hello now, am I telling the truth? And secondly, you only need to look at those mirrors when you need to make a change. You're going to make a decision. You've got to do something. Sometimes it's a good idea to remember where you've been, what you went through, because that will help you to prevent going there again. Hello now. Right. Amen. No, I remember... When I jumped into a relationship, boy, and moved in with that person a week after I met them, and boy, do you follow what I'm saying? Oh, not going down that road again. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna change. Go into that lane again. Those mirrors can serve you, or those mirrors can destroy you. It's your choice. I'm trying to help you through the Holy Ghost today to understand the proper use of rearview mirrors. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.